I will start um, by sharing the workshop folder link that should also be at the top of the chat. Um, if you don't see it for any reason, I can repost this, but in this folder, you'll see the link to the activity as well as my slides if you'd like to follow along. Um, and everyone is also, also has access to my ethical project scoping framework, which you can use after this talk to try and build algorithms that are kind of decent. Um, so jumping in here, I think even kind of going based off the title of the talk, why do we want to discover these harmful algorithms? Um, I think that we're at a point where we've kind of started to see enough media coverage of algorithms doing things that might be sexist or racist and a lot of consumers especially are left feeling like what is there that we can do to fix this. Um, but on the technical side internally, there's actually a lot of steps that we can take. So we want to fix them. That is that is kind of what the whole point of this identification process uh, others, or this discovery process. But I think it really helps us to start by understanding at large what fairness is. So when we talk about harmful algorithms, they're typically harmful because they have fairness related harms associated. So I'll talk a little bit more in depth about exactly what these fairness related harms are. Um, but people often tend to assume that fairness is about the law. It's about our regulations and about our policies when that's not really this the case. So um, I usually kind of start these talks with examples of existing laws that set precedent for caring about algorithmic fairness and that cover disparate impact. But again, there's plenty of laws that we would probably consider unfair or unjust in some ways. Um, a great example of this is actually nuisance laws. So um, especially in the United States where I'm based, uh, these have tended to backfire in the past couple of years. So the image we see on the screen is actually of Maplewood, Missouri. It's a town of about 8,000 people. And a couple of years ago, uh, Rosetta Watson called the police several times looking for protection from her abusive boyfriend. So this actually led her to being labeled a nuisance by the city, um, which resulted in her being both evicted from her home, um, but also being barred from living within city limits for six months. So not only was she evicted, she wasn't allowed to live in the city where she's from because she called the police to deal with her abusive boyfriend. So the kind of nuisance law in place here was really defined as more than two phone calls to police about domestic violence within 180 days. I think most of us, when we start to really investigate what that looks like, I don't think that we would classify someone a nuisance based on that. So when we're talking about fairness, um, we need to start using terms and means outside of just what's legal and what's illegal um, to define what is fair. So what is that in the context of algorithms? I think an, a huge point here is we have to work backwards a little bit. We have a status quo um, and we have people who have been historically marginalized and have seen uh, quantifiably some of the worst impacts of inequality. When we're talking about fairness, we don't just want to level the playing field. That means the people who are still seeing advantages are given some of advantages, and those who are historically marginalized are still getting lesser uh, quality service. So we have to understand that this whole concept of fairness is really complex. Like we are dealing with societal issues that are really hard to parse and really difficult to quantify. So there are 21 different quantifiable definitions of fairness, which makes it really, really incredibly hard to do this work unless we have decided on what we uh, consider important. So what is our definition of fairness? Are we looking at, each individual should be treated the same if they are similar to another, or should each group be treated the same? So if we're looking at race or gender, should we have the same level of outcomes for each group? So it is inherently a social issue um, and is really hard to just fix on technical means alone, and we can't fix it on technical means alone. 
so I think it's also important to understand how we experience algorithms is actually a separate area and in another uh, arena in which people can be harmed outside of the algorithm itself. So things like facial recognition come to mind. Um, there have been several cases recently where we found that these systems don't work for uh, darker skinned women specifically. They don't work for people with dark skin in general, and they have a hard time uh, classifying Asian populations as well. So I'm actually uh, guilty of this myself. A lot of practitioners, we often think that if we just kind of show the level of damage that's caused by AI, that it's enough to make engineers and leadership care about these issues. But it's not really that organizations don't care. Um, while the vast majority of people in these orgs are unaware of the depth of these data biases, um, few teams actually create algorithms with biased outcomes intentionally. And one of the biggest issues is that this data science workflow that we've adopted um, never really allows for the kinds of time necessary to do impact assessments and investigate our data thoroughly. So if we don't shift some of our organizational incentives away from measuring the ROI of an AI system or product um, and towards uh, investing in equitable algorithms, it's going to be really difficult to see this change in industry or see this change um, even within government and then being able to act upon it and measure how far we've come. So, um, this is something I want to participate in as well, and I, I want you to think about, let's say, the last 12 months. Um, we start to, especially with the pandemic, we started to see the adoption of a lot more AI tools um, or automation tools in general. And I'd love to know, have you interacted with an algorithm that you felt maybe treated you differently than others? Um, I've got some great examples of trying to board an airplane and, and being kind of in these slower moving lines. But um, I'd love for everyone to just think about this for a second and I'm gonna post in the chat as well. And what I would love is for us to all hit enter at the same time so you can start drafting. I'll give you a couple uh, seconds to think about this and then we can all hit enter and read at the same time. Okay, and we've got some answers coming in. I understand this, um, having dark skin and having a hard time with teams lighting. Um, even when I'm presenting, I actually notice that I have I get really tired eyes because I consistently have to have um, really well lit rooms to present in. So I completely understand that. And a couple people have also mentioned YouTube videos. I think that's a great example. Um, something I'm actually gonna talk about a little bit more later is how we optimize our results, how we've optimized search images and YouTube uh, recommendations because we care about things like clicks or because these orgs care about things like clicks and they help them monetize and make more money. Um, and it kind of feeds into the circle of unfortunately disinformation, especially in the last few years, as well as consumers noticing like maybe this product knows me a little too well. So I'm excited to dive into those a little bit more as well. So going back to fixing these harmful algorithms, um, the biggest question is always how. What does this process look like? What kinds of steps do we take? And I would identify here that there are four main aspects to fixing these harmful algorithms. Um, the first would be risk identification. So if we don't understand which groups are most vulnerable in our context, it's really hard to create equity. It's hard to prioritize them. And then I would say that we need to inspect these deployment environments better. So companies will make an algorithm or build these, uh, build an AI system, deploy it kind of into the wild. And I think the main issue here is that users are one, usually in the dark about this. Um, so there's no way to start complaining that an algorithm is being used against you because we don't know that it's being used. And the deployment environment oftentimes 
technically doesn't match how they trained models. So um, if you are building a model to predict healthcare outcomes and you're using existing data sets, you may have a lot more information in that data set than the model will actually receive at the time of decision making. And this is unfortunately an incredibly common issue. And because of that, we tend to see gaps in how these models work when they're, they've been deployed. They tend to not work as well and technical teams are often somewhat baffled um, that their work does not perform the way it should by the time it's actually released. We should also be able to make clear who we prioritize. So um, like I mentioned with prioritizing minoritized groups, um, we need to make these clear and state them. The main issue or the main reason for this is because we cannot prioritize every single group. We are going to have to make trade-offs. Um, those are some of the hardest pills to swallow about fairness is that there's we cannot prioritize everyone at once. So if we at least focus on mitigating the harms for the people who are the most historically marginalized within this context, um, at least that way we can somewhat make some headway and start to prioritize. But being able to transparently communicate this is absolutely huge and where a lot of organizations are lacking. In order to make fair, fairer decisions, um, we also need to work with users more often. So especially in public health contexts, finding people who are willing to give us feedback on these algorithms. So being able to perform preferability tests. This is really huge, especially when we're talking about sensitive uh, features. So when we're dealing with LGBT people, actually asking them what they want to be referred to as, um, or actually having a blank fill in the box if we're talking about gender identification. If we're talking about healthcare, we can separate questions of biological sex from gender identification and be more inclusive. These are the kinds of tests that um, behavioral scientists really spend time on in order to to ensure the organizations build algorithms that are less harmful. We also want to investigate our motivations for deploying specific things. So um, there are algorithms out there that probably shouldn't be out there. And I'll, as for an example, um, a criminology algorithm that, that determines if you are a criminal based off of the features of your face. Um, I think we can all critically think about this and say there's not really a correlation between our facial features and our uh, susceptibility to crime. And even further than that, that this actually is a field uh, all of its own called phrenology that um, is really accepted in like white nationalists and, and uh, more right wing spaces. But there is no correlation between how you look and the behavioral things you're going to do. So we've kind of digitized this entire subfield of eugenics essentially by assuming that we can um, use these observed features about us to predict things that are unobservable, like our emotions or our gender. And the last section here um, is really about recourse. So being able to transplant, transparently explain why and how these uh, systems are used. That actually sets us up to create appeals processes, which can be as simple as a literal web form, um, but if we don't have this kind of appeals process, it makes it really hard to actually compensate people when they are harmed by algorithms. And there's some really great examples um, of algorithmic harm, especially in the United States. We have had at this point uh, three people who have been arrested due to faulty facial recognition algorithms. Um, they were deployed by police departments, improperly used, and then they were misidentified, subsequently arrested. And then while they were all released, um, because they were actually not the offenders that we were looking for, they had severe impacts on their lives. Some people lost jobs. Some people, it's about reputation. If you are seen getting arrested on your front lawn, that doesn't really look good to your neighbors, no matter what the issue is. So I think being able to understand that we have to start providing this level of compensation when we harm people uh, really meditate or mediates the, the need to set up this structured recourse process. So all of these things end up adding up to accountability. So when we talk about 
we discover harmful algorithms so that we can be accountable for their decisions. And so digging a little deeper into exactly how people can be harmed. Um, it's important to understand that these harms happen after a decision is made. So after predictions made, and then we have to understand a lot about society and, the, and our um, structural relationships to know what harm is really taking effect. So um, I think a great example of this is uh, by looking at some of the big uh, AI incidents from tech companies recently. So if we're looking at allocation, um, allocation is uh, the fairness related harm where you are not given the same access to some tool or resource. Um, a great example of this is Al Amazon's uh, AI recruiting tool. So it tended to favor men for technical jobs based on the data they used to train this. So um, you can probably blame the training data in this case and that there's few data about women being represented well in these technical roles and women being successful in these technical roles. So this, in this case, this tool would also mimic that, but it ended up withholding these opportunities from women. So you'd have a resume with something like uh, you played basketball for the Lady Wildcats or you went to a women's college. And those were some of the reasons that you would not be recommended for specific roles. Um, and of course, they ended up ditching this tool. But when we assume that the past data is actually um, representative to real life or is good to use for prediction, we definitely run into these issues of allocation really easily. So quality of service is when a system works uh, doesn't work as well for one person as it does another. Um, this is really uh, relevant, especially with facial recognition algorithms. So um, looking at all of the big uh, facial recognition algorithms from large companies, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, IBM, they all worked fairly well for people who were white and male. Um, and they all really, really suffered when they were faced with examples of darker skinned females. And another example of this is uh, Facebook has run into the issue that Google had a few years ago on Google Photos. Um, so not having enough at, uh, examples of dark skinned men and women leads to classifications that are not only dehumanizing, but also just in it wildly inaccurate. So representational harms uh, often exclude people from predictions because they aren't represented in this training data. Um, this happens a lot when we're looking at search engines. So we look up doctor, we look up CEO, and we will find a fairly off um, search result based on the images if we're talking about gender or racial imbalance. And one of the reasons for this is because these search en engines optimize for clicks. And so it's hard to see maybe from a computational standpoint how this would lead us to finding more images of men. But if we take, let's say, the average group of a thousand marketers, um, based off of, they can be any kind of gender or race ratio, but they will also have this internal human bias. And when they're choosing images to use for slide decks, for um, web pages, they may be choosing what seems more appealing. So this might be an internal bias of their own, or it might be a bias towards what they think other people will want to see. And regardless, we end up with results that are similar to this. And Google and Bing have done a lot of work in the past couple of years to actually change this, but you can still find um, artifacts of this imbalance in, in image searches today. So demeaning harms, um, these are actively derogatory or offensive. Um, it's really crucial for us to understand that these harms are not static. So a single AI system can exhibit multiple harms and for different groups of people, and then different groups of people can experience wildly different harms. Um, this one, again, is kind of like the Facebook example, but a few years ago from Google Photos. And their actual resolution to this was instead to remove the tag gorillas instead of retrieve more representative data. And I think that's one of the biggest flaws is we assume this removal of um, offensive derogatory words 
actually changes our outcomes when that doesn't fix the actual problem, which is these tools are trained on data sets that are not representative of users. So a great example of uh, a single system also having multiple harms is, again, a facial recognition. If we are using facial recognition to classify someone's gender, um, one, we can have quality of service harms for, for women with dark skin, just because of how cameras pick up our skin and are actually, um, there are very few images of black women or women of color in these training data sets. Um, and the second aspect is that it might provide representational harms for people who are trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming. So a lot of these systems are classifying gender based off of gender binary. Um, one, because that is what society is largely accepted. And two, because it's actually really easy to train binary classifiers on the data side. So instead of expanding these classifiers to um, also predict non-binary uh, and transgenders, um, it's not only recommended that maybe we don't use a tool like this in the first place, but we really start to investigate the construct. Can we tell someone's gender from their physical features captured by a camera? And the answer to that is no. I think so many um, algorithms and so many AI systems as a whole run into issues because we attempt to capture things that we cannot just capture. <laughs> um, we cannot quantify someone's gender or emotional state because we have an image of them. So understanding that is intent is key to even begin doing this kind of ethical work or to begin discovering why algorithms harm people. It's also important to understand that people are not edge cases. So yes, there are so many variations between skin color, body shape, di diversity of thought, where we're from, um, linguistic regionalities. We are not edge cases. And so many times technology tends to make us feel as if we are. So there are um, several examples of uh, automated soap dispensers not working for people with dark skin. While, yes, that's an issue and people have claimed that there's problems with lighting and distance, but why aren't we working on fixing these solutions with manufacturers during product development and prototyping so that everyone can use these tools? It's unfortunate that we just do not prioritize the experiences of several, of several groups of people. So it's important to know that, you know, it doesn't matter that there are groups that are historically marginalized. It doesn't mean that we get to exclude them from this process or that they don't deserve being included because there are not enough of them. I think if anyone is a consumer of your tool, whether they are disabled of a different socioeconomic status, of a different gender identity, they need to be able to use whatever you build and have the same level of service. And that is incredibly important. And it's more, more important for us to know that we are all outliers in some data set. It can be based on skin tone or several other factors. I think one's, some that are really interesting is how we treat people who are not native English speakers, because it's actually fairly common. And even though we develop technology in the US and with a lot of Western values, we sometimes forget that there are so many languages spoken in the world and we, have a very singular view of natural language processing and building tools based off of language like translation services. So there are plenty of languages um, in, spoken in Canada that are not not English or French. Um, it's also fairly common to not be a native English speaker around the world. When we think about this view, we start to see how narrow we tend to build tools in AI um, to work well for people in Western countries and fairly and pretty much ignore that they don't work well for so many other people. And not only does it make it difficult to interact with these systems, the, it's more likely that these language tools are going to fail when working with you. So beyond translation, um, it's really difficult to get language models to understand uh, local varieties. So there are several words, even in the United States, that we use for things like a semi-truck, 
18 wheeler, tractor trailer. Um, there are several words we use for roads and transportation, highways and freeways. It's really, really difficult for us to capture all of these nuances. And unfortunately, what gets captured are the views of dominant groups of people who are able to contribute to these bodies of language. So when we're thinking about large language models, um, recently GitHub Copilot and Codex have been in the, in the news because they have been trained on pretty much the entirety of GitHub. Um, but even broader than that, when we look at GPT-3, which is the uh, foundation for Codex, um, a GPT-3 GPT is trained on large swaths of information, including social media sites like Facebook and Reddit. When we start thinking about who starts to contribute to these sites. So um, studies have shown that marginalized voices actually get moderated and silenced the most on these platforms. And then when we look at the internal numbers and diversity statistics of these companies, we have very narrow groups of people who are also working on these content moderation teams. So throughout the uh, contribution process of language on the internet, marginalized people's voices and contributions eventually get diminished over time. But then these, this body of language is also used to train large language models that, are, um, that make it nearly impossible to talk about trans people, to talk about Muslims without actually being incredibly demeaning. So another case that's not an edge case, um, but gets treated like one a lot of times in data is men who are bald. There are several reasons for being bald that are medical by choice, um, causing, because of hair loss. Regardless of the reason, you should still be able to interact with the system with the same level of, uh, the same quality of service. However, um, bald men are often underrepresented in these data sets as well. So when we're talking about demographic groups, we aren't just, or groups of people who can be harmed by algorithms, it's not just demographics. It's not just race, gender, and uh, sexual uh, uh, orientation or identi uh, gender identity, but any single feature about you can cause you to be excluded in some data set. So across healthcare and finance, there are areas where we are all marginalized. So I think that the, the one takeaway here is that we should care about this because it does impact us even if we don't see it right away. Um, and a lot of these facial manipulation systems, so things like face filters on TikTok or um, uh, facial manipulation systems that will e automatically beautify your skin. When they're trained on uh, data sets with such few examples of bald men, they result in usually adding hair to their images. So despite the fact that this may not be a sensitive feature or protected by the law, I still think this is something that would bother people if it happens to you. So, um, Given, given what you know briefly about the different kinds of fairness related harms, so quality of service, allocation, representational, and demeaning, um, I'm interested. I, I'd love for you to post in the chat um, what harm, oh no, this did not come out <laughs> the way I expected it to, uh, what harm it sounds like. I'll go back up. Ah, I'll go back up here. <laughs> What harm does this sound like to you? So if you want to post in the chat, um, I'll give you a second to think about this. Like if you imagine yourself, you are bald. If you are not in real life, uh, you put on a, a facial filter like on TikTok or on Instagram and it gives you hair. What are the things that come to mind when this happens? I see someone said all three. I'm interested to see everyone else's uh, thoughts here. And if you have uh, more thoughts and you'd like to expand, please feel free. I'd love to. Um, I'd love to go into this a little bit further. Yeah, I've got a couple people saying demeaning and representational. Absolutely. And it is exactly that. So um, it is also, and I think uh, I did not think about this in the initial context, but for facial filters, it is also quality of service in that 
the filter does not work for you. Um, but also it is meaning you're underrepresented in the data set and it is being demeaning in ways that an engineer wouldn't um, automatically consider. So you're building a tool like this and you don't consider initially how to, how to uh, make people feel certain ways. And I love some of the, qual the um, comments in here and that, yeah, you're made to feel like you sh bald is a status you shouldn't have. Like you shouldn't be this. And you should be more like this. So we have to consider how we develop or how we deploy these tools absolutely impacts uh, how people feel and impacts how they interact with our software going forward. So the discovery of why they're harmful is really, really difficult. Um, and that's because they can be harmful for so, so many reasons. Um, jumping into some of the reasons that AI systems exhibit this unfairness. Um, first is the societal biases reflected in the data sets. So um, there's some great examples of this that I've already mentioned, but I think even beyond the societal biases in these data sets, when we are training these data sets, so many technical people have this urge or this want to immediately remove all of these sensitive features. If your race and your gender is in this data set, they think by just removing that, that you are being fair. When that's not the case, um, that's actually really harmful because that makes it more difficult for us to find unfairness, even though it is hidden in these data sets. Um, what's actually preferred is being able to understand how things like our gender actually correlate to features we want to use. So if we are building a credit scoring algorithm and we're looking at someone's education and income level and all, the, all these factors that are not these sensitive features, but things like education and income level are often tied to race. They're often tied to gender. We have to do more work to understand and we can technically look at um, counterfactuals for fairness. So basically measuring the amount of bias or measuring the amount of um, uh, the, the difference between racial and gender groups um, have between their actual predictions. So um, this is a really huge point to say that just taking out these features we probably shouldn't leave in for legal reasons doesn't automatically make a system fair. Um, and a great example of this is also in image data. So speaking about how we train things to be very Western, when we look at wedding dresses or we look at um, Im these image data sets, and when we want to try and classify people based on what they're wearing, it's very common that we're able to correctly identify American weddings. So the big white dress, the tuxedo, the things that um, hint to Westerners that someone is actually getting married. But one of the problems is we don't have the internal um, well-versed anthropologists, behavioral scientists, social scientists, to also help us do this for every culture out there. So the image you see on the right-hand side is still a wedding. It's just a Nigerian wedding, traditional wedding. So they're wearing galas, they're wearing uh, traditional clothing and necklaces, but we aren't able to identify that this is a wedding. And this is a huge problem because we have so heavily westernized um, our training data sets, basically by not including people from all other cultures, um, so that we're able to identify just them as people, but we aren't able to have the same level of specificity as far as what they're wearing or what kind of event they're attending. So there's also societal biases that are implicit or explicitly reflected in the decisions made by teams. So when we are building machine learning tools, um, it's really common that we actually in, infuse our biases in the decision-making process and in the development process. So some of the ways that this happen are by including certain features. So, um, going through this process of feature engineering in order to 
select good features that have high predictive value can also lead us to making some fairly bad decisions. So sometimes these biases are based on simply our assumptions of what we can do with these systems. Um, I'd say a big one here is the assumption that we can detect emotion. Um, there are a lot of physically uh, or uh, visible and observable features about us that are proxies. The, they are an estimation of our emotion. If someone's smiling, if their eyes wrinkle because they're smiling and their cheeks are kind of enlarged or rosy, these are all observable features, but they are not directly correlated to emotion. And I think that's one of the, the areas that tends to be more dangerous because the, the assumption that we can quantify your emotion is just kind of off base to begin with. And then how these systems interact with stakeholders after they're deployed um, are another area for unfairness. So, um, like we mentioned with the face filters that don't work for specific groups, the way it's deployed and, and the way that specific uh, people deal with these algorithms is actually the source of harm. So I think that's the, that is the one that's really, really difficult to fix because it requires us working with non-technical people and leveraging people in humanities to really understand the potential harm. How can we warn users? How can we transparently communicate to users that we know these systems have some issues um, and how do we fix them? So I think it's also talk, important to talk about who can be harmed by these systems. And I think we are starting to all get the inkling that it can be anyone. It can be any one of us. Um, but these groups are difficult to identify because they are so context specific. So some things that we can consider here. Um, we first wanna understand what is the purpose? What is the objective? What are our intended uses? Um, there are million reasons to develop machine learning algorithms, but really investigating our purpose and specifically investigating the reasons that are related to profit, revenue, um, reduction of man hours and the increase of automation to save money for a business um, or an organization. These tend to have the most harmful impacts because obviously profit is usually more important than individual user data privacy. So from that perspective, we can be more crucial on how we are more critical on how we build these tools, knowing that we have specific intentions and creating thresholds and creating constraints to stop us from getting too harmful. We also need to be getting input from various stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, that's people who can be affected by this system, people who are users, people who are adjacently working with these systems, whether by choice or not. So we have to understand in a lot of cases, um, these large modeling tools get built and then we have them deployed in hospitals and in financial institutions and every bank teller is not in involved in the development process but they have to use these systems and they can experience harms related to these systems as well we should also really really understand our internal standards um, if we have them and if we don't have them begin to set some of these standards set some of the disparate impact thresholds we don't want to be x amount of discriminatory towards specific groups so making sure that we're staying to not just those but also the legal regulations so um, in the us we're looking at things like the four fifths rule as far as disparate impact and and we're looking at specific precedent um, for legal, for what our legal protected classes are. We do need to keep these in mind as well. But also we should really consider these demographic groups that are specifically hard to identify. So um, I would refrain from thinking demographic is um, a protected feature like race or gender. Bald men are also a demographic. Um, and then there's these overlapping groups. So you have bald men with dark skin. When they interact with a facial recognition face filter, they might both be lightened and be given hair. 
So when we're thinking about dark skinned women interacting with facial recognition and bald men, we have to consider how these groups overlap and how they may deal with specific issues that are unlike issues that even the other people in other demographics are dealing with. And so discovering these context specific groups is difficult because they're not obvious, um, you know, after doing research, it's a little bit easier to piece together the various kinds of groups that are harmed, but we have to work with people who are not technical. Um, it is really difficult to have an engineer point out every scenario in which uh, an algorithm can go wrong, and we can't. I think that understanding the reality is we cannot <laughs> um, be perfect. We cannot expect every uh, potential incident. So a great example of this is um, the iRobot, the automated vacuum cleaners. So they were, I believe iRobot is headquartered in Boston um, and they were built kind of under Western constraints and re Western training data. They actually had a recent article where um, they had to do a massive data collection process on feces because they are known for the poop apocalypse, the um, incidents where your Roomba runs over dog poop and keeps spreading it around your house. So while that's kind of a funnier example of the kinds of work you need to do to um, mitigate the harms of these algorithms, when we're thinking on a global context, there was an incident, uh, I believe, last year where a woman in, um, I believe it was India, was using a iRobot to clean her house while she took a nap. And these robots are trained in the United States. And in the context of India, they were not trained to understand that sleeping on the floor or sleeping on the, a thin mat is common. So this small cultural difference actually was the crux of a massive issue in that the Roomba ran over her hair and assumed it was something like pet hair and got the positive response that you should keep running over this and suck a massive amount of her hair into the robot. Uh, and, and so it was, she had massive hair loss. Um, it took over half an hour to remove the Roomba from her head. And these issues our real life, we, we have to understand if that happened to you, you're not having a good day. It's, it's a little bit beyond um, what we'd expect from just a technical failure. And so understanding that the cultural context, a Roomba trained here is not expecting that this is a person. And so that's a, a common way and an easy way to harm people very unintentionally um, while providing a tool that no one would think has fairness issues involved. So let's talk about some of the harmful algorithms in the wild for a minute. Um, I think it's important to go over a couple of these so we kind of understand how they started. Um, really Im image, Im image manipulation is a huge one. So um, we talked about this a, a little bit already, but there have been a couple facial recognition projects where you input someone who's black and they just happen to come out a little lighter or um, you input someone who doesn't have hair and they happen to come out with hair. I think these have the biggest harms, not just for, not for demeaning and making people um, kind of feel badly, but when we start looking at these AI generated faces, I think we can start looking at them a, li a little bit more crucially and start to understand that synthetic data um, doesn't just fix the issues we're dealing with. And many people are of the idea that if you create enough images of synthetic brown people, that that's a substitute for getting actual representative data, and that's not. <laughs> Language translation is also one where we see a lot of uh, gender biases come in because of um, how we work with languages that are gendered and not. So Turkish is actually a language that is not gendered, has um, pretty much one form for both uh, they, he, he, and she. Um, but when we start to translate these languages, as you can see here, we start to import our own biases about who we think is in what role, who is a nurse and who is a doctor. Um, so even when we are doing something just innocent and trying to understand another language better, we can accidentally uh, encapsulate our own biases there. 
So one impact of the pandemic has also been increased surveillance for students. Um, attention tracking is incredibly uh, popular recently and is just now kind of um, getting pushed back in a lot of schools in the States. But what I think it's, it, it's a little bit ridiculous to expect that um, every student can keep their eyes on the screen for an extended period of time, whether it's a class, whether it's a whole school day. Even Zoom actually had this feature embedded. They had attendee tracking embedded in the product and they actually removed it as of April of last year um, because of the commitment to security. These, these tools are not only violations of, they're not only harming us on the fairness axes, but they are also crossing privacy lines. And I think that um, once we start truly recognizing that these issues are very similar, it'll be easier for us to deal with them. But we have to get teams to understand that sometimes not building something is the right answer. And again, emotion detection. Um, this, is, this is just an example that is fairly off base. There um, are so many variations in people and how we look in uh, the diversity of our features, as well as the, the diversity of our, uh, how we react to certain things. So to expect that people of all cultures and all neurodiverse backgrounds um, react or or their their emotions can be quantified in the same way is a really bad example of of ways to use technology and then going into the legal system um i think there it, it's very fairly obvious um how these are harmful if you are arrested and, and you did not commit a crime not only can you lose your job and it's it's horrible for your reputation, but the experience you go through of having to be detained, of having to be questioned, um, it's not a comfortable situation for anyone and no one would want to just be randomly picked up and arrested for something. And um, I, I think it's, it's hard to understate the level of harm here and even, even so, we need to start with financial compensation. We need to start with recourse and making sure people who are dealing with the absolute worst harms like this um, are actually compensated for the pain that they go through. I think that we have not, uh, we've not truly recognized the level of harm that we can cause to people's lives. And I say this because I find that many data scientists and machine learning engineers do not understand that their code can mean not just life and death, um, but severe harms for people because we are lured in by the fact that it's hot, that you can write a neural network in 11 lines. That does not mean you should or it should be deployed in specific ways. So how do we start to identify these algorithms um, in our context? So this process is really hard. It's really hard when you're trying to solve it just from a technical perspective. So you wanna work with social scientists, behavioral scientists, anthropologists um, to discover both vulnerable groups and vulnerabilities in our tooling, in how we've constructed our, in our, it, on if our construct is actually valid. Does, the, does matching the underlying data mean that we're creating equitable tools? So we also want to get a wide variety of feedback from stakeholders internally to our organizations as well as externally. And then even tapping into the general public for more collaborative development. Um, people don't want to have tools used on them that they didn't really have a chance to impact or didn't have a chance to give feedback on. So especially if you're dealing with large swaths of the public, one of the great ways to get this feedback is to do fairly basic surveying and to do what in marketing we see as common focus groups. Have people come in, demonstrate these tools, be transparent about how you expect them to be used, obviously compensate them for their time and actually get the kinds of feedback that your engineering team just can't give you. So for this next section, um, I'm excited to talk about how we can really test some of our hypotheses in government. So um, I think this is a really great way to be iterative and to be um, 
really agile as far as developing new, whether it's regulation, whether it's new tools, but we can take some of our steps or some of the methodologies and data science and data analysis to really help us develop new tools um, in, in using strategies that are really, really helpful and that development teams find helpful. So let's say you have an idea, you have noticed something. Um, basically, you first want to just write it down, formal assumption. You can, this is your hypothesis. You think that um, it would be better for your province if you had free, I can't think of it, free ice cream. <laughs> let's just go to a basic example. I think it would be better for everyone here if we had free ice cream. So if you wrote that down as a formal assumption, then you can take the step to collect relevant data. So you and notice I didn't say that supports your assumption. You want to find this relevant data, and this part is really key, um, that both supports and disproves your assumption. So ensuring that it's relevant by making sure that um, you're considering all of the ways it could be relevant and not just ways it could be relevant to benefit you. So everyone loves free ice cream, but if we're starting to look at maybe a potential um, healthcare crisis and over and um, uh, overloading people with sugar, maybe that's something that we shouldn't do, or do we have healthcare data that supports this? And then we can go through kind of what most data or business analysts do and really analyze this evidence to support or disprove these assumptions we have. So a great example of what this could actually look like, um, let's say we want to fix roads. We think that in, by increasing taxes on the public, um, we can fix the roads that are most critical. And our idea is that maybe the residents will stop using public transit as much since the roads are better. Maybe that's a barrier to them um, using, uh, tra traveling more on their own. And so we might see dip in a dip in our public transit usage. So, what do we do? We want to collect our data on the road and the public transport usage. So things that might be relevant here. Um, maybe we want to know people's attitudes about public transit. Is it already in a state where um, people are kind of feeling that they're not getting great service? Are the buses and trains late consistently? Um, what is the state of them? Are they happy with their cleanliness? Are they happy with the drivers and the conductors? Maybe we want to get information on some of the uh, roads with the largest issues, the biggest potholes, the largest infrastructure issues. This step, I really can't understate how difficult it usually is in real life. Um, collecting these data sets from disparate uh, resources and then attempting to combine them in ways that make sense and then grasp insights out of them that will help us make decisions. Um, this is usually not a, it may be like one step out of these three, but it usually takes a lot of time to actually get this done. But if we are able to use everything at our, at our disposal, um, we found that, you know, we've looked at every relevant piece of data and attempted to understand if our idea here is even, uh, is even uh, realistic then we want to make sure that our findings represent what we assume. So this isn't just proving us right, but um, things like people's attitudes towards technology and specific tools is a really great way um, to do this, but this is probably not data we already have. This is probably something that we have to go and find on our own, um, or we have to submit the surveys ourselves and work through the process of surveying people ourselves. And then we want to leverage talent from the humanities. So I cannot understate, understate how important it is to work with human, like social scientists, behavioral scientists, people who are not computational minded. And I say this because they can actually help us really set appropriate priorities and set appropriate um, thresholds for dealing with vulnerable groups. Maybe in a facial recognition classifier, we are more crucial about false negatives. Um, 
being able to make these decisions is never clear. And I, I think it's difficult because we want a one size fits all solution. We want a simple answer. And the answer is almost always, it depends. But if an organization maybe like Google had social scientists helping them develop their AI, they wouldn't be optimizing for clicks. Maybe they would have found out earlier on that optimizing for clicks is going to bring out the negative biases in society we don't really want to see. So when you do a Google search for boy, you actually get photos of adolescents and, and younger boys. When you do a Google for search for girl, you actually get preteen to older women in most cases. And a lot of times women who are grown um, still come up as girls and usually grown men don't come up as boys in the Google searches. So there are tools you can use. Um, I think there's a couple that I would suggest here. One is the um, ethical project scoping framework. So this really helps you create data that you can reference later on um, how you collected the data to train the, your models and the decisions you made during model development as well. Um, there's also the Microsoft Fair Learn Python package. So this allows you to identify both quality of service and allocation uh, fairness harms. And you can also calculate uh, a counterfactual fairness metric. And this is important for understanding exactly what kinds of proxies or exactly what kind of biases associated to specific, specific attributes like our race or our gender. So when we're looking at overall development best practices for AI, it's really important to identify our product goals and understand how they might tie into priorities that are that don't align with the best for users. Um, and then we want to get the right people in the room. We want to make sure that the people who are vulnerable and this tool may be used on are actually involved in the development process. And we have to also select an approach for fairness. If we are using equalized odds for our fairness metric, if we're using a counterfactual, if we're looking just at disparate impact, all of these things matter. And we have to be transparent and communicate that when we do build these tools. Next, we can analyze and evaluate our systems. Did we, is our construct valid? Um, is our understanding of the world valid? Is our deployment environment appropriate for the kind of algorithm we want to build. And then we can take steps to mitigate these issues. So setting constraints for fairness, um, making sure that we are using observability tools and are tracking if this fairness starts to drift over time. It's one thing to um, calculate fairness at one point, but as we develop AI tools, they are be consistently being updated with new data. And we can find that this fairness does drift or trail off, and we want to ensure that that doesn't happen. It's also really important to monitor continuously and have escalation plans. So if someone is being harmed, if someone um, want, has an appeal to an algorithmic decision, we have to have plans to escalate these issues. And that also comes with auditing these uh, systems frequently, as well as transparently communicating the results of these audits. There are several steps, and I know this sounds tedious, but we have to stop thinking about fairness is something we can tack on at the end. It is something that does have to be ingrained into the entire development process. So there are some technical pitfalls that I will warn you about. Um, and I think the first is really understanding that there is not one fairness metric. You cannot use one metric and say um, that a tool is fair. And there is also not one definition of fairness. I think that is what makes it complicated. Um, we have to look across multiple um, metrics and truly create something that's comprehensive and communicate that as well. Um, and it's, it's not a good idea to look at just performance metrics like accuracy, precision, and recall. They actually don't give us enough information on demographic groups, harm, fairness. Um, if we use only those metrics to understand if, it's a, if a product is good, we are just going to reinforce pretty much the status quo and build products in the same way that all other harmful products are built. 
And we also have to explicitly state the assumptions behind these metrics. Um, we have to explicitly state the, even for performance metrics, what we mean when we're talking about accuracy, precision, recall, R squared, um, we need to do the same thing for our fairness metrics and for our assumptions. Um, and again, not relying on that invalid proxies. So a smile is an invalid proxy for emotion of happy. Um, someone can be completely unhappy and be smiling. And it, it, we understand on a human level that it's contextual. Maybe it's a fake smile, but we really can't teach that to machines with just images. Um, and do not infer someone's demographic information. So this is a huge problem when we're looking at race, especially in systems, um, uh, in legal systems. So how people, how we collect data on race varies wildly, at least in the U.S., from department to department, um, from individual segment of the department. Sometimes it's someone who is an outsider observing someone's race. Sometimes it is um, self-identification, and sometimes it's based off of their driver's license and other documentation, leading to misidentifications of race um, and misclassifications. And lastly, don't forget to consider intersectionality. So this can be um, men who are bald with dark skin. This can be um, dark skin trans uh, people. This can be so many different groups that when we specifically look at just race, gender, and protected classes, we tend to miss a lot of these groups and we tend to uh, overlook some of the harm that is actually more severe than some demographic groups deal with. So what does this mean? We've got to engineer for equity during every single phase of ML design. So during problem formulation, is this even an ethical solution to our problem? Um, are we going to be able to misuse this algorithm in another context? Is it something that we should use in a very limited capacity? Do we um, have enough data really, if we're constructing data sets, uh, do we have enough data of minority samples? Um, do we have really skewed data? Are we, you know, applying some debiasing algorithms during this step? Moving into like algorithm selection, it's really, really hard here because we have to answer things like, does our proxy measure what we think it does? Um, does a smile measure an emotion? Uh, do we need to model specific minority, minority populations differently? If we're looking at historical context, maybe we start to change our modeling practices. So there are steps we can take at every single point of the design and development process that actually get us closer to uh, engineering equity. And so if you do not remember anything else from this talk, um, a couple points I want you to remember. We cannot address fairness at the end. We cannot discover a harmful algorithm after we've built it. Um, all of this must be done during the process. Having humans also oversee this process or having humans in the loop doesn't automatically address fairness issues. There are scenarios where um, judges have been given risk scores. And when these scores don't match up to how they would um, uh, hand down sentencing for a defendant, they often tend to override them and go with their own decisions, which tend to be more harsh in several cases, or they tend to be more harsh, harsh in cases of minority defendants. So assuming that having a human overlook or confirm or deny these decisions does not fix the problem. And then there's no one size solution. No, there's no one size fits all solution. Um, fairness doesn't have a single definition. We have to be explicit about what kind of fairness we need, our assumptions around that, and that our strategy for mitigating fairness is open to change and it can change at any time. So lastly, I think um, we've, had, we've seen a couple examples of this of um, female technical candidates, just because we match maybe an underlying distribution of historical data. 
doesn't mean that a system is fair. This is where I urge us to start thinking about counterfactuals and to start thinking about equity. Um, because when we look at groups who have already been minoritized um, or who are underrepresented, it's not enough to just match the existing data set or match the existing ground truth and hope that we create something that is fairer than the ground truth because we can't do that. Um, we can't do that until we start to maybe flip our representation levels. If Asian people make up um, nearly 5% of a data set, maybe we start to switch our population representatives and start testing on uh, these technical algorithms on minority groups in different ways. And these systems cannot be fixed by simply technical or simply social solutions alone. It has to be socio-technical, so we have to get um, really well-qualified and knowledgeable uh, social scientists and really strong engineers who understand some of the social issues to work together on solutions. And that is how we see um, algorithms become less harmful over time. So for things you can start doing, um, I've got four big tips. Um, first is really working with your project managers, um, program managers, people who are uh, helping the engineering process. We need to create more time in this process to really allow for this type of fairness testing. Um, the One of the biggest concerns is that engineers just do not have the time, even if they know what they should be doing. Um, Second, we really want to uh, Im implement observability tools. So there's plenty of ML ops platforms that allow you to not just track like accuracy drift, but also track fairness drift over time. And these tools will give us more insight to how our models are actually working in development or in, uh, uh, in deployment. And we want to start measuring algorithmic fairness. So um, fairness can be calculated in a couple ways, but you can, in just a few lines of Python code, um, calculate disparate impact and actually see if different groups are getting treated differently. Um, and last big tip here is to make sure that you are auditing both your data and your models. Um, you can work with third party ethics groups or internal leaders um, or contract these organizations and perform these audits continuously. As we update models, it's really easy for them to grow stale and it's really easy for them to um, start working in ways that we don't expect them to over time. So for, some, a couple, for a couple additional resources, there are some great organizations you can reach out to. Um, the Algorithmic Justice League is one, uh, Data for Black Lives is another, and the last logo here um, is Ethical AI Champions. So if you are looking to get some help uh, internally in how to build these tools and how to um, build tools that are less harmful, we are another organization you can reach out to. So for our last couple minutes, um, I am also going to put this link in our chat, but I actually want us to go over what it looks like um, when we are attempting to, let me make sure I send this to everyone, awesome. So let's see what it looks like when we're attempting to actually solve this. So I'm gonna stop my screen share of this and attempt to, get it going for my Google Colab. So um, this is just a in-browser notebook you can use. You don't need to install anything. Um, and you actually aren't going to have to really code. So this is built in a way that we can hit the little play buttons um, and actually see the results of uh, the data set, the model building, um, without you having to write much code. So let me make sure I can share this. And let me know if I need to make this bigger or if uh, this is okay to look at, but um, pretty much this activity goes over disparate impact in a couple other metrics. So it helps us describe how we are biased towards privileged groups, specifically in this context of gender bias and hiring. Um, so if we go to, you can actually, if you'd like, um, you can see the expanded background here. So this talks a little bit about the data sets um, used to train this actual model. But what's really important for us is this scenario. So 
briefly, we talked about it already, um, gender bias in hiring. Let's say you are a company and you want to hire, but obviously you want to be a little bit more um, equitable about who gets in this uh, in the in your pipeline to get hired. So um, if we're training on past data about people, it's really, really easy to just duplicate or mimic the existing biases in the hiring process. So um, many organizations have tried and failed, uh, similar to Amazon, to create tools that um, allow them to hire with, with less bias than traditional means. So um, this references the gender pay gap um, and kind of doubles down on what I was saying earlier about being gender blind doesn't really help us. Um, gender is often correlated with income. And so we can't just take these features out. So I'll actually move us into the training data section. Um, and if you are able to follow along, you can click the button here. If you are interested, you can have a look at the code. But um, our first step is really just gathering our code set. You can see that that ran. And our next is to see what this actual data looks like. So um, we can see we've got some green X's and red X's, some green and red circles. Um, the green X's are women who were actually hired. You can see them on this plot. Um, red X's were women who were not hired. You can see them along the bottom of this plot. Uh, green circles are men who were hired, and the red circles are men who were not hired. So based on the first couple rows of this, um, we can just see that we have gender labeled uh, pretty much as zeros and ones, hired if they're labeled as a positive and negative, essentially. Um, and we have calculations for their past income and some of their work experience. So moving down a little bit. Um, I think I, I really like this first question. What is, what's the first pattern we notice from looking at the data? Feel free to um, write in the chat or raise your hand. I don't know if you guys want to do that and yell it out, but um, what are some of the patterns you notice here? Yeah, definitely some more representation of men overall. Um, Alistair, like, like you said, in this higher income, higher experience, uh, segment especially. And yeah, few privileged men um, were not hired. So looking at the green X's, there's just a couple in here, just a couple. Um, oh yeah, there's, there's some really good comments. So I'm sorry if I keep looking over here. Um, yes, years of experience is absolutely correlated to income more for men than it is for women. Um, let's move down to actually creating a fairness score. So um, there are several metrics. Fair fairness, disparate impact is one of them. So um, one way we can kind of measure this hiring decision is the acceptance rate for men versus the acceptance rate for women. Um, and ideally, these should be the same. So that's kind of the whole notion behind disparate impact. Um, it's, often called the P percent rule. So um, if men and women are hired at the same rate, this percentage, P percentage would be zero. Um, if women are hired at four fifths the rate of men, this percentage would be 0.2 or 80%. So I know this is incredibly US centric and I'm sorry for that, but um, if we're looking at the legal cutoffs in the States, it is uh, four fifths. So we cannot have an algorithm that uh, is higher than a 80% P-rule. Um, so let's run this code below. This basically is going to calculate what our acceptance rate is from women, as well as calculate what it is from men. And so we can see we had 200, 2,000 data points in this example, um, 925 privileged or hired examples, uh, and over 1,000 unprivileged. So in this positive class, um, we have about 81% of men. So out of our sample, 81% uh, of men were actually accepted or hired. And 24% of women were accepted or hired. So um, if this is based off of past human-made hiring decisions, um, it's not too surprising to see this, unfortunately. So um, this pretty much tells us that women are hired at 29% at of the rate that men are hired in this data set. 
So even though this doesn't necessarily need to be thresholds for legal, uh, for disparate impact, I think we would say it's not a fair algorithm. So what, what can we do about this? So um, if we're looking at only 29%, um, it's probably going to keep making decisions along these lines in the future. But we'll start, start looking at the complexity of um, how we fix this. So what I'm doing is pretty much uh, training an AI on the data above. And I sometimes I hate to say AI because I know that in this case, it's a single model. Um, but if we look at the training process, once this is, okay. So if we train an AI on that model, this is where our cutoff would be, this blue line. Um, our accuracy ab about, um, as far as making our predictions similar to the original data set is about 87%, which most technologists would say, that's great, that's good enough to work with, that's good enough to ship. But we're gonna keep making incredibly biased decisions. So we're going to have a 25% um, P rule. We're still going to hire women at a way smaller rate um, than we hire men, but it is based on historical data. So it's technically accurate. Um, and so I think it's really difficult here because we have to understand um, you know, we can continue to make bad decisions very easily. Um, and I know we will probably not have time to get through this whole slide, but I really want to know um, how, how do you think, this first question is what I'll go over, how do you think uh, the AI learned this gender bias, even though we didn't include gender in this as a feature when we trained this? So feel free to drop your answers in the chat. Um, have a further look at this, but it seems to make similar decisions. <laughs> I've, I've got some thoughts here, but uh, I'm interested to know, you know, if you, if you aren't including gender and you are using anonymous um, factors as far as predictions, why would we choose to hire some and not hire others at the same kind of rate? And this one's a little bit hard, so I will, I will expand here. Um, one of the reasons for that is the correlation between gender, years of experience, and uh, prior income. So, um, sorry, I'm, I'm reading, <laughs> reading some of the uh, comments here. Yep. Um, we have had a bad practice historically as far as hiring when it comes to being equitable across genders. Um, so it's really, we are inferring some of these causal things and not saying um, this AI, while it can have uh, allocation harms towards women, is it embodying sexist ideals? Yes. Is this AI technically sexist? No. It doesn't even consider gender, but that's separate from the actual impact, which is if we were to put this out into the world, we would embed this, the exact same biases as we had during this process. So this leads me into another question, which I think uh, it will be really interesting is if that's the case, what do we do? If this is our um, historical data, do we A, use this historical data going forward regardless? Do we B, maybe start to reconsider um, what, at what ratios uh, our thresholds are at? So do we um, start to specifically include more women because we know even our historical training data set has excluded them. I'm interested to uh, hear your ideas. And I see people starting to add some comments in. Um, what I really don't want to get lost right before we go is that um, one alternative, uh, one alternative to just training based off of really biased data is training to attempt to maximize both fairness and accuracy, which isn't always possible. This blue dash line you can see is where um, our model is actually calculating or is being constrained, right? Um, but what this really kind of leads us into is 
this last section here. Okay. And we're not really considering our accuracy of this fair model compared to um, a one bit trained on bias data, but it leads us to question these social aspects. Yes, um, work experience is discounted for women. Yes, women also typically have childcare duties that it has impacted their income and work, years of work experience historically. The question for us is, if we build something that is fair, how do we change that? We can start to shift our development priorities based off of this context and understand no, we don't want to create a model that is 99% accurate to historical data. I think we have to understand that and it's okay that, and it's okay that we do that because of the downstream impact is why work on a project like this, like Amazon, I cannot imagine how many man hours they spend putting into this. And then they scrapped the entire project because of this issue exactly. So I think when we start to change our development practices and change our mindsets on what we prioritize and not prioritize accuracy, prioritize fairness. Do we take women out of this specific group and model them differently because we know that there's a uh, historical impact of childcare duties and past marginalization, past lack of access to the same um, edu education and work uh, opportunities. If we know that, then that is the, our precedent for changing our, for changing how we develop models. And that is about it for me. Back to you, Alistair. Uh, that was amazing. Uh, I have to say, it's one thing to sort of talk about these and I really love the clarity of your classification of the different types of um, algorithmic bias, you know, uh, be, is it degrading? Is it marginalizing? Those kinds of things. Um, but I also think that the, um, you know, seeing it played out live like that just underscores how even if you think you're doing the right thing, you're you're introducing this kind of inadvertent bias. Um, so obviously that was a great run through that stuff. And I think on behalf of everybody who's who's on, if you have additional questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Uh, what is the best place for people to learn more about this or get in touch with you if they have additional questions? Yes, um, please feel free. I'm very active on Twitter at Data Sci Bay. I can drop that in the chat or um, happy to answer some questions via email. So I will make that available for everyone as well. Amazing. And this is recorded. Thank you all for those of you who uh, joined us. Obviously, it's uh, soon after the summer, so we appreciate y'all being here. Uh, but this is recorded and will be available uh, to past to attendees of the 2021 event on our on our platform. And so you'll all have access to this video as well as the folks who are attending the general conference um, in November. Um, yeah, this was an amazing overview of that. I really like the taxonomy of it. And, um, you know, it's great to see this stuff structured in a way that I think most of us can get used to. Uh, Canada has been doing a pretty good job with defining some of the AI governance and guidance that's out there along with the digital nations, but this makes it pretty clear that there's still a lot more work to be done. So really appreciate you being here and helping us with that. Um, appreciate everyone for showing up and uh, paying attention to this topic. And uh, I guess we'll see you on the internet and um, appreciate you taking the time to put together the workshop for us. And we'll make sure this gets out to people in recorded format as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks everyone.